and welcome to the Monday edition of DC Today, coming at you live from our studio here in the New York office. Uh, really an interesting day. It was an interesting weekend. Uh, actually, a lot of our time today will be uh, covering some of these events in Russia over the weekend that in a lot of ways seem more like a, uh, a future you know, movie um, uh, than a geopolitical thriller you know, brought to the big screen as opposed to uh, market sensitive activity, but as has been the case through a handful of things in this Russia Ukraine war, uh, there is certainly some degree of market impact. I want to unpack a few things where we stand now. But just first, in terms of the market today, the Dow ended up flat on the day. It had been up 100 points, more or less, that was the exact high. It had been down 100 points, more or less, the exact low, and closed, you know, right there in that mid spot uh, around zero. The S&P, though, was down about half a percent, and the NASDAQ was down over 1%. So you had a very slight reversal of the tra trajectory from last week. The the top performing sectors today were, were real estate, which was up two and a quarter percent, and energy, which was up one and three quarters percent, and they had been hit last week and had a pretty sizable rally today. And then the worst performing sector today was communication services, which was down almost 2%. That had been a big rally spot last week. So I don't know if it's a total mean reversion yet, but at least a, a, a partial one here today. Um, that theme in markets, though, remains kind of the interesting story. I'm going to unpack a lot more about this in Dividend Cafe on Friday, but certainly it has remained a bifurcated uh, uh, market. But bifurcated does not mean half up, half down. It's really been um, less than 20 companies that are the lion's share of market returns, um, really six or seven that are a sizable amount of that, and then kind of everything else. You do have just barely half. It's a tiny bit over half of the S&P that is above its 200-day moving average. Um, and then, you know, until the um, uh, more recent uh, period, you're talking about, uh, by recent, I mean today, you're talking about banks and REITs uh, being the most troubled part of the market. And so, yeah, they both had a little run here today, uh, particularly energy and REITs. But that, those rate sensitive and those liquidity sensitive areas of the market, um, I think, have been more troubled. Utilities have been a mess. Uh, anything that is really levered to China recovery that has been underwhelming, energy is the great example there, hasn't garnered much 2023 momentum yet. We'll unpack more of that on Friday in Dividend Cafe. Uh, the other thing I'd say at the dctoday.com, if you like some of the links that I'll occasionally put in, and I try not to put links to outside articles much unless I think it's really special because I know we all have so much we're already trying to read. Uh, but the Atlantic ran a story on crypto that I thought was fascinating and the impact um, that the speculative zigs and zags the whole crypto space has had so far, what that means for its future investor base. And I thought it was an article worth sharing, so I did. As I mentioned, though, the Friday night of news of a sort of coup d'etat underway in Russia, uh, at least an attempted one, was quite uh, interesting. And there was a, a sort of mercenary chief, and I can't pronounce the name. Uh, so I'm just going to say Prigozhin, but I don't know if I'm here. I've heard it pronounced on the media so many different ways. I can certainly phonetically spell it out. But uh, for those who are really astute at Russian pronunciation that are offended by my mangling of this, I uh, beg your pardon. Um, leading troops out of Ukraine into a city south of Moscow uh, with the intent, he said, of basically attacking um, Moscow was, uh, was really something else. Putin had come out and made a video presentation to the country, calling it a treasonous act, vowing revenge. And then six hours into the day on Saturday, it was announced that they had come to a truce, that he would be sort of exiled off into uh, Be Belarus, and that the attempt at this sort of siege was called off. And I wouldn't be sleeping great, you know, <laughs> if I were, let's call it Prigozhin. Um, but what an interesting turn of events. And the most interesting part is not that it happened or that it failed um, or the sort of half full, half empty for both sides conclusion to it. 
it is the fact that there's just no denying that it exposes some vulnerability to Putin's hold on power. There did not seem to be a strong uh, rally of support from the military, from others in Russian uh, aspects of government. There was very little noise to come to his defense. And I think as a sort of knee-jerk response, it seems appropriate to point out that this doesn't seem to bode well for Russian strength and unity and resolve in finishing out um, a Ukraine war successfully. And yet, I wouldn't want to be making any prediction that this thing is over. Uh, there, you know, there. It just seems to me that it increases the odds that the way it ends has to do with an internal Russian move more than um, some sort of victory in in the Ukrainian uh, conflict itself that that reverses their aggression, the Russian aggression against Ukraine. There could be something internal that unfolds. And that's really, I think, what this weekend opened the door to. By way of the Fed, um, I just think this is worth continuing to point out. It, it's globally incoherent, not merely domestically. We talked about the incoherence last week of pausing this month, but then saying we need to do two hikes later in the year and it leading to some people, this your current analyst included, saying that I don't believe them there'll be two more hikes this year and yet everyone being open to the idea they don't really know what they're going to do. But you did, have, um, you did have the Swiss National Bank last week effectively um, hike less than had been expected, right as the Bank of England hiked more than expected, and the European Central Bank hiked exactly what was expected. So there were a couple of different indicators uh, from different central banks, and it's pulling in a number of different directions, just as domestically and internally our own Fed has done. Um, his congressional testimony last week by his, I mean, Chairman Powell, it didn't move markets. Um, it, it was basically exactly in line with the script from the week before from the Federal Open Market Committee. Uh, I think it's a jump ball at the late July meeting. I will point out it is a late July meeting. There's a lot of time and a lot of data that will come between now and then. Um, so I understand pricing indicators, as and that really refers to the futures market, uh, the Fed funds futures, um, indicating more likelihood of a pause, of a hike at the next meeting after this pause than not. I see an ongoing pause as entirely possible. And I see that as a form of tightening. Um, and so the, it isn't like if they were to uh, uh, stay still, that all of a sudden that becomes a form of easing. And that's a point I'm going to make in the Divin Cafe Friday as I elaborate on it more for what the second half of the year holds. Okay. But speaking of a uh, Later in this week, the Fed's money supply reports comes tomorrow, Tuesday, M1, M2, M3, where things stand. All those money supply indicators have been negative here for several months. Speaking of negative, the rig count dropped for oil, for crude oil, another six rigs last week. We're down to 546 nationwide, so about you know 40% down still from our high. Um, the, the lowest, this is the lowest level we've been since April. Natural gas rigs are the lowest they've been since March. So we've continued to see more rigs coming offline in both oil and gas. Um, why am I against doomsdayism? In 1900, 20% of males died uh, at childbirth or in their first year. They never made it to their first birthday, 20%. Um, now you have uh, that age 62 is the age at which 20% uh, uh, do not make it. So pretty handsome increase of life expectancy for males over the last 100 plus years. Someone had asked me in the Ask David section what uh, recovery looks like normally after a Fed pause. What happens in the economy, what happens in earnings traditionally when the Fed does a pause and they've been in the middle of hiking. The problem is that if there were a precedent, and I'll tell you right now there isn't, it still wouldn't be predictive. If there were some precedent from before, I wouldn't even pretend for you that I thought it was somewhat useful in predicting what will happen this time. 
But really, pauses in the past have been, we are hiking, we're going to pause from hiking, and then we're going to go uh, to cuts. And, and so I see that as something that is very different from um, hiking, pausing, and then hiking again. And that's what the Fed's saying they're going to do, and we don't know what they're going to do. But to try to extract from past occurrence some uh, baseline expectation for the economy or for corporate profits or interest rates across the yield curve, I think would be totally impossible. So anyways, we've covered a lot of ground there. I'll have a, a daily market synopsis for you here tomorrow as well uh, from New York. I really uh, welcome any questions you have, questions at thebonsagroup.com. We're looking forward to really finishing the first half of 2023 strong. Uh, we're here for you, and we uh, encourage you to reach out if you have any questions for us. Have a wonderful evening. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching, and thanks for reading the DC Today.